We are glad that you're here. Thanks for coming out tonight. I know there's many other places you probably could be, but we're thankful that you decided to join us as we worship the Lord and learn more about Him from His Word. We're excited to be here tonight as Pastor is going to be continuing his series on hook, line, and sinker. And I'm excited about that first hook that he's going to be talking about. And I just want to thank you for coming out here tonight. Let's take our hymn books, would you? And let's turn over to hymn number 363, 363 at Calvary, all right? Once you find that, go ahead and stand, and let's go ahead and sing on that first verse, hymn number 363. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. seated. Turn, we flip over just a couple pages to hymn number 366, hymn number 366. We are going to be taking some time for a few testimonies tonight, and so I've got the mic here, and uh, if I can have one of the guys in the back, Mr. Andrew, you want to come do the mic for me here tonight? What I'm going to have you do is if you've got a testimony, I'm going to ask that you would just please uh, use the mic here, just raise your hand, wait for him to come to you with the mic, that way they can hear um, this is not necessarily for us. You say, well, everyone can hear me in here. That's right. But for those who are listening and joining us online who can't uh, be with us tonight, uh, they have expressed so many times how it's such a blessing to be able to hear what you're saying because when you're online, basically all you hear is it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher without the mic, all right? And so they want to hear and be blessed by your testimony. So, all right, so I know maybe you're a little bit of afraid of the mic. I promise it won't kill you. It won't bite you. It won't shock you or anything you know, drastic like that. Um, pretty positive about that at least, all right? So um, just wait for it to come to you, give your testimony then, and that way we can all be blessed by it together. If you have a hymn, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll, uh, and just let me know about that one out loud, all right? Hymn number 366, let's sing the first and the last verse of this one.
Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only and always living in me. What a great, great thought that is and a goal for our life. All right, anyone here got a testimony to start us off with tonight? Maybe let's start with a testimony. Probably has a, do you have a testimony or a hymn? Do you have a hymn that you want to sing or a testimony? Okay, go ahead and tell me the hymn. 363. We just sang that one, but we can come back to that one. That's a good one. He likes this song, so we may come back to Brother Joel. 269. I'll write that one down here. 269. All right, how about a testimony here tonight? Miss Rosie in the back there. I'm thankful for uh, my two daughters that God bless us with. Their birthdays were um, Friday, and then the other youngest one is today. So 23 and 21. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Someone else with another testimony or praise here tonight? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to thank the congregation here. Uh, it's very rare and hard to find a church where the congregation actually does life together and um, the congregation members text you personally outside of church um, to ask updates on prayer requests and make sure that you know you don't need dinner that night and um, just actually doing life with each other and making sure that you know your sister in Christ and um, family members aren't struggling when you know everybody else in the house has the flu and life is just going on. Uh, I had so many ladies just text and. Um, let us know that they were praying for us, um, offer to bring meals, um, bring by an extra dog collar when that broke too, and um, I'm just really thankful for this congregation and um, all the ladies that God put in our life through this church. I appreciate it. Amen. It's called bearing each other's burdens. Amen. I'm so thankful that we have a church like that. Someone else here, did I see another hand raised for a testimony? They probably have hymns. We'll, we'll hold off for a second, guys, all right? Any testimonies here? Up, up front here. Is this thing on? Hello? I'm just uh, really grateful to see everyone in church tonight. You know, driving up, it was you know packed parking lot. And so, you know, with everything that's going on, I know all my friends are texting me about the Super Bowl, and it's like, no, nah, I won't be there tonight. So just grateful for each person here, and thankful for your testimony. Amen. 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 I feel like I should make a, a joke about the Super Bowl being a little flat this year, but maybe I won't. <laughs> Anyone else here? All right, let's sing. Let's do one verse of 363 again at Calvary. We'll sing, uh, let's sing just that first verse. Uh, that's a great one to sing again. So let's sing on that first verse, and then we'll flip over to hymn number 269, okay? <laughs> Calvary enough, can you? Turn over to six, uh, or sorry, 269, 269 here. And let's sing a couple of verses of this hymn. In the Garden, 269.
second here of when you get alone with the Lord and you stop and you just talk with him there's a joy in that moment as you're fellowshipping with the Lord that nothing else in this world can meet and so often we get so distracted by other things and it's when we get back into the word we get back into prayer we're like this is what it's all about this is what he intended to have that close walk again once sin broke that but Jesus allowed us to have that relationship again through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And man, what an amazing privilege that is. Think about that as we've seen on this last verse. I'd stay in the garden with him. testimony here tonight. Brother Joe in the back. I just want to thank the Lord for his promises. As I was reading through uh, Genesis again, um, I was just amazed at uh, what you read there about Abraham and the promises uh, that God <clears throat> made to him. And <clears throat> I was thinking about that from the standpoint of here we are 4,000 plus years later. And God is still continuing to keep those promises that he made to Abraham, either through Isaac or through Ishmael, regardless. But it just reminded me that, you know, I praise the Lord for the promises that God has made to us. That he'll never leave us or forsake us. He always meets our needs, that all things work together for good. I mean, you can just go on and on and just know that the promises that he makes he will never break, and I praise the Lord Amen. for that. Mm, amen. Praise the Lord. That's the one thing I love about as you read through the Bible, and uh, you get into the Gospels, and you see it so many times. It says, and as the Scripture was written, it was fulfilled. Or even in the uh, Old Testament, as I've been reading through the book of Second Kings, and uh, it says even down to the number of generations that God promised Jehu would reign with his family for honoring God, even though they messed up. He said, hey, I will let your sons to the fourth generation reign on the throne. And right down to that fourth generation, they reigned on the throne. And uh, it says, as the scripture was fulfilled. And man, hey, when God says something, it's going to happen. You know, uh, as I told the teens, um, the bio, you know, there's that statement that says, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Uh, the truth of the matter is I don't have to believe it. It's going to happen no matter what, okay? It doesn't matter what I do. It's going to happen. You just get the choice to believe it or not. And uh, what an amazing, amazing uh, God we have who keeps his promises. Can we turn over to hymn number 230, hymn number 230? Let's sing this hymn before we uh, do some announcements in our offering tonight. Glory to his name.
always blessed already. Uh, we began today receiving our faith promise slips for missions. We'll be collecting them next week, and the 18th will be our tally update. We want to add up, and we're praying for $2,600 a month to be able to support our missionaries, actually increase the missionaries that we have. We have 12 missionaries, and then also to be able to take on another one, Lord willing. So as of right now, we have uh, $610 a month. And we're about a third of the way there of where we have been supporting missionaries. So we've got a ways to go. But be praying about that as a church that others will join in with us and we'll get that taken care of. Well, Brother Ed has Master's Club this Wednesday, and that is Red Baron Night. And um, is it okay if you bring a sock with camel? Because that's what Snoopy always flew was a sock with camel, right? And always fought uh, the, uh, the Red Baron. So that'll be this Wednesday, soul winning on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. We invite you to come and join with us. And uh, we can't have cold weather, we can't have sleet and snow, but on some of these days we're still able to go out. So you come even through the winter. Um, Brother Matt has told us this morning about the parent night out and the teen night in. And that'll be on February 16th. We're able to watch your kids for you so you can have the night out. And that's a fundraiser for our teen group. Ladies have their next meeting will be February 20th here at the church, 7 o'clock, and the theme is Encouraging Missions. So we're excited about our ladies being able to help and participate, do the work of the Lord in uh, praying, as we saw this morning, praying fervently and effectually for missions. Okay, let's have the men come. We'll receive our evening offering, and if you have anything that you'd like to pass along to me, a note, a prayer request, or an updated faith promise slip, just get that to me or place it in the offering plate. And uh, we'll continue with that. Brother Joe, great to have you in town this weekend. Would you go ahead and pray? Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be here tonight and to uh, worship you again. Lord, that we would be able to be here this morning. And Lord, we thank you so very much for your word and uh, the truth and the power in your word. And Lord, what it means to us and how it uh, works in and through us. We just pray that your word will be uh, spoken this evening. Turn over to hymn number 579, 579. We'll sing Onward Christian Soldiers. And we can't sing this one sitting down, so if you could stand up one last time with me. Let's sing this. We'll sing a couple verses of this, and then as soon as we're done here, all the kids are going to be dismissed for a special program in the back with Miss Becky. So hymn number 579.
Paul with Miss Becky and she's got a special program she's got ready for you guys as they prepare for Easter as we've seen on that fourth verse. We'll be looking at 1 Peter chapter 8. I thought I'd read a verse to you to start out tonight with Matthew 4, Matthew 24, 28. I was thinking about preaching this, and I thought, well, I've changed my mind, and we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 5. I just wanted to get the verse in anyway. Matthew 24, 28, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So, if you're concerned about where the eagles are tonight, they're with the carcass. So, we'll see if that verse is actually prophesying of something other than the revelation. We're in 1 Peter chapter 5. And I love that song we just sang. That was providential that we sang that. I mean, Matt and I don't talk and confer about picking songs out uh, for the, the service. But, you know, that was um, Winston Churchill's favorite hymn. And the people of England, believe it or not, quite a change has taken place since World War II. But in the late 30s, as the British soldiers were marching through the streets of London, they would march to that song. That's a marching song, if you think about it. This timing, 4-4 four, four beat, emphasis on first and third, and uh, onward, Christian soldiers. They would march to that, believe it or not. And uh, he said that, that was, there were such inspiring words to that song. And, and as we were singing it, I thought, that's what we're studying tonight in God's Word. Hell's foundations quiver at the sound of praise. Satan's host doth flee at the sound of praise. And I thought, wow, 
How, how can that be? Well, the Bible tells us that God inhabiteth the praises of Israel. I believe He also inhabiteth the praises of His people in this age. And when we confidently and in faith look forward to the future victory we have over Satan when he's tempting us, and we start praising God, God's going to give me the victory. He already has at Calvary. I'm going to make it through. We will not slide. We will not fail. We're going to make it through. God's, this is not the end. I'm not defeated. I'm victorious. Praise God for that. And when he hears that, the Bible says that God inhabits the praise. That means God is there fully present. Now, he dwells within us, we know, but he is fully present in the scene. Hell's foundations do have to quiver at that presence, don't they? And Satan's host will flee. What a wonderful message that is. Then the next phrase is we're learning, we're singing in that song, it says, we are not divided. We are one body, one in faith and one in doctrine and one in charity. There's, there's such a unifying factor that we as believers here tonight in our church, we agree to one body of doctrine. Amen? Amen. And we are one in that way. But we're also one in, in a special way, and that is we have unity in our love. And, and I thank you for the praises that were shared tonight in regards to that. And if, what a wonderful, special privilege that is. So we can move onward and upward for the Lord. We're in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. <clears throat> and our topic that we're studying for a few weeks is called Hook, Line, and Sinker. And this is the study of the tactics that the devil uses to lure us away to break down our faithful stand with the Lord Jesus that we might falter, that we might fail. And he has every, every tactic at his disposal, and he'll use them. And we want to be aware. We are not <clears throat> foolish. We are not ignorant of all of his devices. So let's review these things and prepare ourselves. My hope in, in this study, and it encourages me so much as I study and prepare, thinking that something that might be said in these next several messages that can help spare some one person and spare a home and spare a family and help because Satan is hard at work in attacking. We see in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Let's pray, and uh, let's get into our next study. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would show us great things from your, your word tonight as we look at this next aspect of how the devil works at tearing families apart and destroying lives. We ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Let me take a moment just to review what we, what we did last week or the last time. If you were not here, um, just listen quickly and we'll give you the basis of that. We looked at the truth that there is, surely is a spiritual warfare that's present among us, isn't there? Our world is not just made up of what we see tangibly, touch, in our, we vis visibly see. Our, our world actually has an unseen world that is dead set against us. Principalities and powers and high places and spiritual wickedness. They are there, and Satan is at the, the, the top, and he is seeking whom he, he may devour. And he wants to pull us down and break into our lives. And when we do that, we allow a stronghold to be built. And we looked at how we could tear down those strongholds and, and how he attacks against us. And we explained that the battle, the spiritual battle, how do I fight a spiritual battle? Not with the carnal things or the fleshly things. It's not by rolling up my sleeves. It's by the power of God. How do we tear down these strongholds that have entered into our life? It's through our mind. In your mind, you do it. And we did a long time studying on that. And we need to have these imaginations corrected, changed, changing your thinking from a false reality to the truth. And we closed out with Philippians chapter 4, and what to think on. God prescribes for us the specific thought processes He wants us to have that we will dwell on, meditate on, and think about. I did not bring with me a flyer that my wife received in the mail just this week about how to retrain your brain. It's a nursing seminar that's being held in Nashville. She's invited to it. 
and uh, she gets these things around the country, Atlanta, Cleveland, and Nashville, and, and, and it's interesting that the secular, unsaved world, through all of their research and, and, and all of their scientific <coughs> um, analysis, have determined that there is a way to retrain your brain. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, it's funny that they're only beginning to scratch the surface or beginning to tap into the truth that God already lays, lays down for us in the Bible, retraining your thought processes. Now, what they're trying to do is they're trying to cause you to rethink things in such a way as to break bad habits and develop good ones. But isn't that what God wants us to do? Yeah, so it's interesting. I'm not going to go to the seminar. I'm going to spend more time in the Word because I know this works. But this is the way in the imaginations of the thoughts of our heart is where we yield to the, the luring of Satan, and we must have our minds saturated with the, the thinking that we need to from God's Word. That was a review from last time. For tonight, we're, we're looking in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, He's a roaring lion. He walks seeking whom he may devour. So we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. We need to be ready. And let me show you one of the ways that he employs a military tactic. And that would be, take your Bible, turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 10. Second Samuel chapter 10. Let's go back to the stories of King David and his generals and see one lesson from military warfare. I do not remember who wrote back in the ancient days, <clears throat> I believe it was an Asian or Chi Chinese gentleman, the, the Art of War. Was it Sheng Shu's Art of War, something like that? What was it? Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu, his Art of War. I have not read it, but I have heard that, and I don't know this to be true, I can't verify this, but I have heard that at West Point, in military training, some of the teachers actually refer to different battles that were listed and described in the Bible and learn simple principles about warfare from that. So let's do that. Let's learn from one lesson here in 2 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 8. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate, and the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and Ishtab and Meachah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. So they are surrounded. Here's, here's Israel. They are surrounded by different nationalities that have come out against them on more than one front. This is not a good situation. This is, you know, basically certain death. How can you fight someone at your face and when someone at your back is trying to kill you. It's an impossible situation. This is certain destruction. They have been entrapped. And what, is, what are David's generals going to do? And Joab says this, verse 10. <clears throat> he put himself in, in battle, verse 10, and the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he may put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me, but if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God, and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. And Joab drew nigh, and the people that were with him unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And one of the blessings that God sent was one of the children, and when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fled, they fled also before Abishai and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. And if you read on down through there, you'll see that the victory was won. How, when you are surrounded on more than one front, how can you face an enemy this way? We know the devil is seeking whom he may devour. We know there's principalities and powers in high places. We know that the devil has a host of angels and his enemies, his demons, are our enemy, and we are encircled. How can you fight on all sides? Great lesson I want to 
point to you tonight is just one lesson. And that is the tactic of the devil is to fragment or to divide and conquer. I wish I knew war history enough to be able to use some illustrations, but you can imagine in your mind, throughout history there have been times when that tactic has been employed and an enemy will go in and break the forces into two sections and they themselves, when they cannot help each other, they're both defeated, divide and conquer. The devil wants to divide and conquer. He wants to take you and isolate you from those who can help you. He wants to fragment the core that is there. And you'll find as you go through the years, as you are under satanic attack, and it comes at all times and in all ways, he wants to take each individual from the family one by one and pull them apart from each other. The family unity, the core thing that God created for the purpose of supporting and strengthening one another and helping in the battle is now fractured apart. That's why God gave Adam a wife. It is not good for him to be alone. That's why God builds families. Now, this may sound uh, a little crazy, but when God gave us children, I looked at those children and I said, I'm ready to give my life to this child that I've never seen before. That's love. And I realized that I am going to expend a lot of part of my life helping this person. But in return, the benefit will be that that person will help me. And when I need it, I need to be strengthened. And in my small household of only four, and some households have two, some households have one. But when you look to those in your time of trial, God has provided those to help you. There have been times, folks, when I've gone to the living room and said, family powwow, and we sit down, we kneel by the couch, and I have I humbly asked, I said, I need some help right now. Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? And we've spent time in prayer. And it's not a humbling thing. It's not, it's not embarrassing. It's the truth, folks. We need to call upon one another, and we need to be ready and prepared to help one another in the spiritual battle. And we, we have an open policy. When, when we are in need, we go to each other and we pray. And we encourage and we help and we, we have Bible time together. This is what builds and bonds a family. And if Satan can stop that, if he can start isolating you from one another, he is already beginning to divide and conquer. That's what he's doing here. And so I'm going to give you five ways, very practical ways. I'm not going to give you a verse of scripture for each of these. Just give you some practical advice and some comments about how you can just look at your own life and see, is Satan getting a foot in the door for family fragmentation. Let me give you five ways. The first one is this. We spend less time together. You know, as the kids grow up and you get busy and all this going on, we just spend less time together. You have a busy life. Your life's busy. The kids' life's busy. And we are now taking on commitments of life that are actually committing us to other things than each other. We're pursuing careers. Why do we have to have an important career? Sometimes it's just to, play for the to pay for the toys and provide for things, things that really don't help us. America's crazy about getting more and more things. I, I was talking with someone after church today, and they were talking about so many different contraption devices and, and technology and all these different things that, hey, you just got to have the latest thing that came out. Why? Why do we need all that? Now, I'll grant, granted, I'll give you the washing machine and the dishwasher. I use those, and that's a big help. I'm glad we don't have to take a whole day just to do, to do laundry. You know, we need to have some things. You don't have to, but it's nice to have a few things. But we don't have to have everything, amen? amen. And sometimes we are so committed because we have overcommitted ourselves financially for things we don't need. And by the way, there are things that don't nurture our children in godliness. That's our key investment area. That's where our emphasis needs to be. I'm not going to say that's where our money needs to be because if you put that as the first priority, you may not have the money to put anywhere. But putting the home, the children first, we need to address the most pressing issues in the home. 
we spend less time together and the home becomes a pit stop. And society out there is conditioning us that this is normal. This is what the normal household is. Once they reach 10, 11, 12 years old, they're so busy in all the different activities that they're going through throughout the week. If we step back and analyze, we don't have any nurturing time. There's just no time to fit that in. We're supposed to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and there's no time for it because we've overcommitted ourselves. And somewhere passing between rooms on our way to the refrigerator, we catch a glimpse of this other member of the family, and that's all we have. And that, my friend, is not quality time. We need to have quality time. We think about little kids being dependent on parents, but have you ever thought this? Big kids are no less dependent. They're still very dependent in different ways. They really are. I went to my mom and my dad when I was 23 years old and I asked them for counsel. Should I marry this gorgeous, wonderful girl that's so wonderful, loves the Lord, and submitted myself to their counsel? I needed counsel. And I had lived my own life and was on my own. But still I went back to those who loved me the most and cared enough to pray for me and give me wisdom. Older folks need it as well. You know, for those of you that have young children, don't believe this lie that you need to let your kids make their own choices and that if they make the wrong choice, that's how they'll learn. They'll learn from their mistakes. I'm here to tell you today that that's not always the case. Sometimes our young people grow up And we don't involve ourselves in their life and say, well, they're on their own, they're growing up, they're making their own choices. And they make a wrong choice and it almost reinforces them in making another wrong choice. And they're down the wrong path. Let's not let that happen. Let's try to nurture our families more. Show them that the Bible is the absolute truth and we have to obey the Bible. That's what comes first and foremost. Solomon, by the way, We think of him as the wisest man that ever lived. What's the one thing that he could not pass on to his children? I've been talking to my sons about this as they're growing up and looking at their own life and finding a spouse. And I've quoted to them from Proverbs. Houses and lands are the inheritance of fathers. I, I I can build a house and I can leave it for you. And uh, I can own land, and I can leave that for you. I can, I can give you that. Houses and lands are the inheritance of fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I can't pick your wife. I can't give you the perfect wife. Oh, I might say, hey, this is one that's really, really spiritual and godly. She's a perfect fit for you, your personalities and all that. You know, I could be dead wrong because God knows what I don't know. And I've got to leave that in God's hands, and I've got to pray for him and say, you know what, son? You had better be walking close to the Lord, and you better be really on your knees and finding God's perfect will for your life, because it's your job, man, and you've got to depend on God to do that. I can't give that to you. Solomon, what was the one thing he could not leave his son? Rehoboam. Rehoboam became king, and under uh, under his reign, the nation split into civil warfare, How did he fail? His dad was the wisest man that ever lived. How could Rehoboam be so foolish? It's because wisdom is not passed on through your genes. Just because they grow up in your house doesn't mean that they're going to be wise like you. Wisdom comes from spending time with God in His Word and working it through your life through experience, and they have to do the same thing. And if they don't do it right, they're going to be a fool. And you need to be there to help them. Mom, Dad... If you don't have children, husband, wife, think about this. You need to be able to pass on wisdom. How can you do that? You've got to be there for them. And so let me give the second reason why we have <clears throat> these, this fragmentation. The second is this. We allow time with other people to be the greatest influence. Time with others as the greatest influence. Now, this is really flies in the face of the way our society thinks. Once a kid is 13, 14, they're on their own. They're busy with this and that, and they're going their own separate ways. And folks, think about the number of hours that they are to, with those other people. 
It's just a simple mathematical equation. You can deduce this. Who you're around the most is who's going to influence you the most. And so this is a critical time. If you have a young person in the house, then make sure that you are providing for them that peer pressure from you, not from their peers, because their peers are not going to be the best influence. So make sure you have, that's the second one, the time with others is the greatest influence. Third way we have family fragmentation is this. We believe the lie that there's a generation gap. Have you ever heard that phrase, generation gap? That was real popular in the late 60s and the 70s. Oh, man, there's a generation gap. Uh, my dad was the constable. You know what a constable is? Back in rural areas where there was no police presence, we, we lived in a county, and the county had a sheriff's department, but we were so far from the sheriff's department, I mean, you could call if the phone was free. We, I mean, you had to take the phone. We had a telephone. It was, this is mid-70s. And you had to pick up the phone, and you had to say, um, hello, um, excuse me, but um, <clears throat> can you hang up so I can call? We had party line telephones. And I mean, you could listen to your neighbor's gossip, and then you could gossip, and you could say, excuse me, um, I, I need to call the hospital. Can you please hang up? I'm just about done. Okay, <clears throat> so we had that. You could call the police, but guess what? It would be like over an hour and a half to two hours before they would get there. So they had constables. And my dad was voted in to be the constable. He had no training in police work. He was a constable. Basically, a constable on patrol would be what? A COP, a cop. That's where we get the phrase cop. Do they even use that phrase anymore? So here's this constable. And I was out riding with them one day. We were traveling down to see my grandparents. And, and all of a sudden, this is the, the, the late 60s, early 70s. And, and we had all these peace-loving flower children laying in the road high. <laughs> and my dad's driving down the road, and he stopped. And he got out. And here's why he was elected constable, because he was a man of great character, someone that they could trust to handle the peace in the community. So he went over to them, and he says, all right, we need to move everybody off the road. And so he starts moving them off the road. And they're like, oh, wait, no, man, old man, we know the new old man. And I'm sitting in the front of the car, and I'm looking over the window. No seatbelts, of course. We're just looking out the window. And I'm like, oh, wow, look at what Dad's doing. And so finally, they wouldn't move. Oh, man, he's passed out. We can't touch him. Don't mess with him. Oh, you're going to hurt him. And he said, my dad reaches down, grabs him by the arm, drags him over, and throws him in the ditch. <laughs> Then there's the other group that was there that was all surrounding, screaming at him. They decided that they were going to attack him. And so realizing that he was going to be attacked, he ran. He could not get to the driver's side. My 15-year-old sister was sitting in the front of the front seat, the middle of the front seat. And, and so he's, she's sitting there, and he jumps in the passenger side and shoves her over and says, Drive! Says, I don't know how to drive! Drive! As we were starting to pull away, they reached in the car and they grabbed my father, trying to pull him out. He was able to secure the door closed. They were reaching in. <clears throat> he took the arm of the one man that had reached in, and I'm in the back seat, just watching. And uh, he took it, he twisted it around, and he said, floor it. And so my sister was like, ah. and I remember. I remember this day, watching all the crowd grow distant and the guy going <laughs> on the side of the car. At that point, he let go. And I remember turning and watching this man go <laughs> down the road. We never had any more flower people getting high on the road anymore. <laughs> That's how things were dealt with back then. I think the statute of limitations has taken place, so if this message is being you know, reviewed, and if somebody's going to go after him for doing something in abuse and assault, it's too late. <laughs> when I think about all of that taking place, the words that were used over and over and over in my whole childhood growing up was like, there's a generation gap, man. And I believe that they may not say it with flowers and with marijuana anymore, but there are still this mentality among us that there's a generation gap. Don't believe that. That's a lie. My children, I, am, I know I'm an old fogey, and I know I'm not a cool, and I know I'm not touched. but you know what? I've never been cool. 
And you're like, so that's not news to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've never been cool, Pastor. It's just the way it is. There have been people that were always cool. They always fit in. They were always, the, I never was. But you know what? I don't, I'm not trying to be cool to my kids. I'm close to them. I love them. And we can share intimate, personal, transparency, heart to heart. And that's what we need. And that's what you need for your family. You need to be able to say, there's no generation gap here. There's an age gap. And there's an aching back gap. And if you want to go ice skating and I'm thinking, oh, okay, son, I'll go and I'll watch. I don't want to, I don't want to skate. You know what? That's we need to say. There is no generation gap. Number four, we lay our core relationships on an altar of lesser pursuits. We lay our core relationships on the altar of lesser pursuits. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew, uh, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Can I be transparent with you and share one thought with you? I have a fear... That fear I've had, I've had all through parenting, and that is that I, my greatest fear is that I would become successful at things that don't matter and fail at things that do. That I would be successful at things that don't matter and fail at things that do. There is, and this, folks, is common among all generations. Malachi chapter 4, at the very end of the Old Testament, verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what is he going to do? The most important thing he could do. He's not going to do trivial things that don't matter. He's going to do the most important thing he could do. This is Elijah coming back. It could be referring specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. It could be referring to the prophetic view that, that uh, Elijah is going to come again in the book of the Revelation during the, the, uh, the tribulation. But even Christ was pointed out as being the Elijah that would come. Elijah the prophet. And he shall do what? The most important thing. And what's that? He would turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. And if that doesn't happen, I will come and smite the earth with a curse. That's what matters, folks. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it describes very clearly that in the latter days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. And folks... The Bible's very clear when it talks about husband-wife relationships. It talks about a man, and a man's number one love of his life is himself. That's true. He grooms it, he takes care of it, he feeds it, he makes sure all, everything's just okay, and then he is commanded to love his wife. Why? Love means self-sacrifice. And so the man is a very selfish being. We've got to die to self and give our life to other people. And so Satan, if I can recap all of this, this practical uh, comment, Satan wants to split your family up one by one. How can you fight this war on all sides? You have to fight it together. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. A verse I want you to keep in mind for, as a focus for your family. Matthew 12, 25, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. That's one of Satan's. We're going to cover four or five of these different tactics that Satan uses, but this one is called fragmentation and isolation. If he can split between you and your wife, between mom and the kids, the kid and another child, in any way, if they're pulling against each other, 
then he's already beginning to win. And the house shall not stand. Folks, this is a challenge to us. Let's go back and let's try to remove all the fragmentation. Did you know it happens in a church too? In Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25, the uh, writer of Hebrews gives us the admonition that we need to make sure that we're in church every time we can. Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people, that's just the way they are going to be. And guess what? They're the ones who are going to be isolated off. And when you're isolated, that's when you are completely 100% open and prone to be attacked by the devil. God gives us illustrations like this in nature, doesn't He? What does the elephant do with their young? Or the water buffalo with their young? And all these hyenas and jackals and all of the tigers and lions gather together to attack, and boy, they've got their tactic, don't they? How is it? Distract over here while another one catches from the rear. And they bring them down. But the herd needs to stay together. And the herd all backs toward each other, and their haces are out, and their horns are ready, poised to attack, and they are defending the little ones inside the center. That's what we have to do. You cannot leave the herd. And so they begin challenging the herd, and the enemy tries to drive it and get it on the run. And if they can steer one off by itself, down it goes. And so forsake not the assembling of yourself. It's so important for you to come to church every time you can. We are not saying that you need to be in church for us, although that's the truth. We love you here. The singing's louder. I can't say it's always better, but it's great. Love to have you here. And I love to see you, and I miss you when you don't come. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, because there's a lot who aren't here tonight. That we're here in the morning. But let me tell you this. If Satan can get you off to the side, you're the one going down. You're isolated. Don't let that happen. You need to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you need to be loving and transparent and say, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm having a tough time. That's why Wednesday nights are so critical. That's when we can share so much with one another. And Hey, would you pray for me? I'm just kind of overwhelmed. Like when it rains, it pours, everything's falling apart. And the church can be there to pray and to help and to nurture and then when we praise God together, Satan's hope to host doth flee, right? And hell's foundations quiver. Preemption was a word that really became popular quite some time ago under the, the leadership of George W. Bush. His Secretary of Defense, if you recall, was Don Rumsfeld. Remember hearing that phrase? Preemption was what he was pushing for. He was not saying, well, let's not, he, he was saying, let's not wait until we're attacked. We know there is a threat. We know it's out there. Let's preempt. Let's go get them before it ever happens. He was referred to as a hawk. He was hawkish. And it was not popular in America at the time. He was called extreme. He was the lunatic fringe. He was, words fell on deaf ears. And then September 11th happened. We didn't preempt. We were defeated. Then we had to respond. Are we so foolish tonight that we would think that we're never going to be attacked by the devil? Now, I don't know if I've ever in my life been specifically pointed out and personally attacked by the devil. I, I, I'm not ready to say that because I know he can only be in one place at a time. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. Um, he, he is not eternal. He does not have any of these, these uh, uh, the, the attributes of God. But I do know this. He has a whole lot of people working for him that are set up in a power structure system, and he has one over Clarksville. And who is he going to be looking at? He's going to go around to Bible preaching churches first. He's, and, and so maybe not Satan himself, but one of his demons is going to be focusing on attack. And folks, I know that to be true. Are we so foolish to think that the devil will never send someone to attack your family? It's going to happen. And that's why we're here together. 
We are not here to say, praise be the one family over here and shame on this other family over here because they've got problems. That is not. Oh, son, we are all one army. We are all under attack in different ways. And Satan is getting a foothold into different lives and families. That's why we're here. That's why we're all working together. And we love each other and we're praying for one another. Folks, we've got to pull together. Stop, stop pointing out differences and issues and problems and say, we need each other. Because the attack is going on all around us. And let's not be foolish to understand it's not going to happen in your home. The devil will seek to attack. His number one way is to start pulling you away one person at a time. If you see someone disconnecting from the family, pray harder than you ever have. Reach out to them and love them. As they get older, you cannot force them back in. And you're very limited in what you can do as they are out on their own. But we can be ready in case that disconnecting starts to happen. Let's work. Let's, let's be preemptive. We don't want to wake up one day and find out that the person that we loved is now a victim and totally destroyed. So, folks, let me warn you. Don't think that you have lost them at that point, perhaps you're already losing them now. And we need to act preemptively and build this family. We know the enemy. We can anticipate his activity. He know, we know he's going to strike. We know his modus operandi, and that is to fragment your family. So let's do everything we can. Why don't you go ahead and say, God, help me seal the cracks. Help me have that bond, that glue, that bonds lives together. I've failed. My family has failed. We all fail. But Lord, help me die to myself. Put aside my aspirations, my ambitions, and all of my dreams and my goals that I might invest in this other person that we might be bound together because they need me and I need them. If not, I'm going to be waging the war over here and trying to wage it over there, and we're both going down. I need you to fight and I need to fight for you. So commit this. Commit right now. That tonight, before you pillow your head and go to sleep, to take some time and say, I'm going to, with the Lord's help, remove separation, remove isolation, and I'm going to rebond with my family. That's an encouragement to you. Let's pray. Lord, we know that your scripture is very clear. We learn many things from many different things, even from the story of a war, that our lives can begin falling apart, or we can have tremendous victory, and we can conquer this battle on both sides. And we know that, as Martin Luther said, just one word will fail Satan. One word can cut him down. And that word, Lord, is to call upon you we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for the guidance and the wisdom and the counsel that's therein. Well, Lord, we pray right now, I pray for all of our church family that we would bond close to one to another, that we'd encourage one another, that we would strengthen one another and fight this spiritual warfare together, Lord, lest one of us go down. We pray for your help. Bless our children as they learn music. We thank you for all who are serving in the church. And Lord, there are families that are not with us tonight. Perhaps they've gotten distracted. Perhaps they've had priorities in the wrong place. Lord, help us not be angry, but help us to love them and realize that isolation can bring them down. We need to reach out to them. We need to bring them back in. We need to nurture them and care for them. And we pray that you would grow our church and make us to be strong. Help us to reach this community for you. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.